Hi, um, I'm Sue Charman Anderson. I'm the founder of Ada Lovelace Day, and welcome to our third Ada Lovelace Day webinar. Uh, I'm here with uh, Laurie Beer, the Global Chief Information Officer of JP Morgan Chase & Co. Um, we are going to have time after our chat for a Q&A, so please do leave your questions in the comments on either Facebook or YouTube. So welcome, Laurie. I'm so glad that you could be with us today. Thank you, Sue. It's so great to be here with everyone on such a special day. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so today, Ada Lovelace Day and JP Morgan have launched our Why STEM campaign, asking women to share with us why they chose STEM careers. Now, you studied computer science and you've worked in IT and healthcare and now finance. So can I ask you that question? Why did you choose STEM? And what advice would you have for your younger self? Yeah, so I actually started college. Um, and when I was trying to decide what I wanted to do, I loved math and science. And so I decided originally to go into electrical engineering. And then as I was studying electrical engineering and I took my first circuits class, I realized I had this passion for this programming class that I was taking and I decided to make that switch into computer science my freshman year. And so I was able to continue to love my, the continue with that love for math and science, but then do something I felt incredibly passionate about. And that's really served me well, in, even into my role as the global CIO at JP Morgan Chase. And so, you know, if I were to give some advice back to my younger self, I'd say a couple of things. I think I'd learn a little earlier in my career how to strike that right balance of, you know, taking care of myself, focusing on family, focusing on work. But also when I think about how do I prepare myself for even future work, you know, be a continuous learning learner. It doesn't stop when you leave college. You know, I, I am continuously learning every day. The pace of learning is changing. The amount you can consume and learn is changing. And just learn different things, not just about your job, but everything around you. What are the trends that are happening? And the final thing I would really say is I would have told myself to take a few more risks earlier on. Mm -hmm. I think you learn the most when you're kind of in those situations where you're not in your comfort zone. And so being able to push yourself outside your comfort zone, you're not going to be prepared for that next job, you know, but go for it and, and really go to something, go towards something because it's going to push you to learn even more. Those would be some pieces of advice I'd yeah. give myself. I think it's important to embrace failure as well because we learn so much more from when we don't succeed than when we do. Um, and I've seen some interesting work on uh, startup founders and the ones who are successful have much less un understanding of why they're successful than the ones who fail. They know exactly what happened and why they failed. So I think we need to embrace uh, the opportunities that failure brings. Um, so in the US, there are estimated to be 2 million unfilled jobs in STEM. Uh, in the UK, the shortfall is costing businesses 1.5 billion pounds per year. Um, there are so many great opportunities for women in STEM. So do you want to touch a little bit on how young women can begin their careers in tech? Yeah, you know, one of the things I think we all across the globe need to focus on is how do we continue to provide those opportunities and learning very on in the educational process, even through games and math and puzzles and um, games. Um, you know, I think it's just so important. And how do we really help also educate parents around what is and are those jobs of the future? Um, with that said, though, I think once you're in the educational system, continuing to push to learn about technology, because technology is really embedded in every business today and the products, the services, the customer experiences. And so whether it's taking a class or joining a club or a coding boot camp, I think there's many, many ways. And when you get into high school, more and more, I think, because companies are realizing practical experience really helps shape your overall education, look for those apprenticeships, look for those interns. They're even starting in high school now. Look for those opportunities, whether it's code for good, to, to give back, but also 
learning and developing your coding skills or thing, other organizations like that. I think there's many ways you can get involved and then continuously um, look for those opportunities, even, even once you graduate and get into the workforce. And of course, for a lot of degrees, um, there'll be a module in computing. And I know a lot of people who studied bioinformatics or ecology or astronomy uh, who had a coding module and then went on to become software developers. So I think, you know, it, it's very important to think there's not just one route into, into STEM. Um, so you believe so strongly in supporting women in STEM. You've actually created a scholarship to support women. Why did you do that? And, and what kind of change do you hope that will bring about? Yeah, for, for a few reasons. First of all, um, my kids were lucky enough to get some scholarship into university. And then we realized that as a family, we had the opportunity to be able to afford um, sending our kids to college. And so we started actually by just giving back the scholarship money that our kids had had acquired because we could afford to pay for university. And so it started um, in that way. And then we've continued to grow um, scholarships. And a couple of things why I wanted to do it now is not only to provide the financial means, but the coaching and the development. And it was partially because I was involved in the university where I gave the scholarship to and I was watching the trend and when you start thinking about the trends that there's less women graduating in computer science today than when I graduated in computer science, I knew that myself and our family, we wanted to do something to try to make an impact. When I look across my career, you know, there were those times in my career where someone took a chance on me. And I think sometimes, you know, uh, individuals, students, they just need someone to take a chance on them. And so part of it was the financial support, but another part of it is the coaching and developing and helping them think about their careers. And it was so fulfilling. It actually led us to grant more scholarships in the STEM field, but also open to other underrepresented areas in, in the STEM field. Fantastic. Can you talk a little bit more about the coaching side of things? Because I think mentoring and coaching is is really important. And um, again, you know, we've got studies that show women just don't ask for the mentoring that they need and they don't sort of get access to the advice and support that they need. You know, I think um, when you think about it, there's a lot of good um, mentoring, just helping helping someone understand what are their opportunities and their path forward. I'm a really big advocate for supporting too, not only helping someone see their potential and helping them achieve it, but creating those opportunities and supporting them through that journey as well. It's incredibly important that everyone thinks about, I always think about it myself is my personal board of directors. And that context for me has always worked well. I've sat on a public board before and it's generally a group of people that you pull together that bring different perspectives, often different than your own, mm -hmm. that can really help coach you and advise you. And for me personally, it's been an important part of my development. And you can imagine that when I made the decision to leap from healthcare into financial services, who was the group that I went to to say, does this really make sense for me? How am I going to navigate through this? And so not only mentors, I think all of us need mentors, but supporters. Who's going to really be there for you um, as you make those leaps in your career um, as you go forward? I, I couldn't agree more. I think one of the most important things I ever did was create uh, an advisory council for Ada Lovelace Day. And it, it's so important to have people to bounce ideas off. And like you say, just ask, is am I being sensible about this or is this a bad idea? And just having that third party feedback and, and having people who are willing to say, you know, when you're feeling like, oh, I'm not sure if I can do this, then, you know, they're there behind you kind of cheering you on. It's it's really, really important. So I, I kind of advise everyone to find themselves a coach or a mentor because I think it it really changes how you think. Um, and I think it, it kind of it certainly has given me more confidence. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, one of the things we're sort of talking a little bit there really about teams, and we know that diverse teams uh, are better. Diverse teams produce better solutions to problems. Um, diverse companies, particularly ones with women in leadership roles, do better financially. 
Um, you know, so diversity is not a nice to have for businesses. It really is uh, you know, fundamental to business success. Um, we know in the UK, the gender pay gap is largely down to um, there being so few women in senior roles. So how can businesses recruit and promote more women? I think part of it starts with helping women understand um, what are the jobs of the future? What does it actually mean to do the types of jobs that we think about? I think there are some historical stereotypes. If you think about most jobs in technology today and even broader in STEM, they're highly collaborative. You work on these agile product teams. You work very aligned with business and technology and other, other key parts of the business. And, and so I think part of it is understanding that, you know, what is the, what are the jobs, how, you know, and where is the demand for those jobs going? And as we've known, and I think through the pandemic, it's only further emphasized that more and more businesses are continuing to look at ways to digitize their business processes, continue to, to evolve. And so part of it is just helping people understand what are those types of jobs? What is the demand in the future? Then it's about, you know, also being open minded about alternative talent pipelines. We know very well that if you, if you graduate in computer science, um, there's lots of job opportunities that are out there. But even we as a company have become much more open around if someone demonstrates the ability, the creative thinking, the critical thinking, um, and we, we're willing to put them through a program we call Tech Connect, a coding boot camp, and then put them into our software engineering program, looking at people that have left the workforce and returning to the workforce. So just being open-minded about where do you recruit from, um, the availability of talent. Many people are considering things like micro degrees now um, and mastery of skills um, versus having a full blown computer science or software engineering degree. And so I think those are all different ways that we can think about it. And that's on the recruiting side. Then on the, the, promote, the, the develop, we need to make sure again, there's those programs that are not only developing the technical skills, but all the skills that are required um, on an ongoing basis, whether it's confidence skills and how do I think about, you know, continuous learning and critical thinking and decision making and get my comfortableness with taking risks. So there's a huge component of develop and that helps drive retention because when we think generally about um, technologists, software engineers, they like to, to create value. And so, what is the path to be able to create value? They like to, we like to continuously learn and we really like to have an environment where we feel supported um, and can, again, deliver to the, you know, create value to the best of our ability and continue to have something where we see that there's growth and potential. Mm -hmm. And so that is really critical from a retention perspective. And then promotion, you know, we've looked at, for example, across our promotion processes, are we, you know, how do we think about not only diverse slates when we hire talent into the company, but are we being as broad in our thinking when we think about also promoting within as well? Yeah. And certainly we, we have this issue um, with the, what's called the mid-career marathon for a lot of women drop out of STEM industries when they're kind of 10 to 20 years in because they're not getting access to leadership roles and creative roles. Um, and I said, I think the the development side of this and, and showing women that there's a pathway forward is so important because, you know, you know women kind of, you know, we do have a, a ambition, um, which I think is something that societally maybe we think we shouldn't, um, but it's OK to be ambitious. And it's important to, to show women that they can realize that ambition. Yeah. So in terms of diversity at, at JP Morgan, you know, can you talk us through some of the projects that you have and, and that you're involved with, you know, how they work and, and um, you know, what sort of outcomes you're seeing? Yeah, and so um, many of the programs that we have um, are not only around talent development, as I mentioned, not just from a 
software engineering or technical discipline, but starting programs early on in terms of ongoing development, confidence building skills, leadership development across all levels. We used to have them at the senior level, but we realized again, to work the overall pipeline, we need to push some of that back um, earlier into the process. So really at all level, there's on, ongoing uh, leadership development opportunities because today, especially when you look in technology, I could be a scrum master, I could be a product owner. I don't necessarily have to be the leader of a significant team. And there's lots of leadership and development capabilities that, that go along with that. So we've really built leadership programs as one element across. Um, we've built programs that help people, all, all of our team, open their mind about the differences that, that you know, all members of our team have and how do we become more open-minded about those differences. And so that's another thing that we've gone through that has continuously made sure that not only are we focused on diversity, but inclusion. And how does inclusion come into play when we think about uh, that as well? Another thing I would just highlight is we've had a, have a great program called Take It Forward. And we've really been able to measure results and Take It Forward is a little bit more of our grassroots efforts um, around women who join. We have programs that support them, but they really have even their own circles of you know where they get together and someone can be the leader within that circle and they can share ideas around even things like how do you balance work and small children those kind of things and so take it forward has been something that we started in a few of our tech centers and has really grown across the company um, and those are just a few of the ways that uh, we continue to support and to be honest, we're continually learning. We're continuing to learn what are the next set of gaps and how do we close that those gaps as we go forward as well. Yeah, and I think I would want to mention as well that um, Ada Lovelace Day is working with uh, JP Morgan in London to provide mentorship to women in tech uh, in the UK. And I think that's something else that I've, I've found quite interesting when I've been looking at the scholarship around mentoring is the benefits that mentors get that we quite often think that mentoring is all about the mentee getting all of the benefits and the mentor kind of bestowing their wisdom. But actually, and we've found this with this uh, mentoring program is that the mentors are also learning, you know, they're learning to give feedback, they're learning leadership skills. Um, and, and so I think there's so much more to the the sort of coaching and mentoring and the, the general support systems that we can put in place that help women to navigate their careers because I think the idea that you know you leave university as a sort of fully formed human adult and you know exactly what's going to happen and how you're going to get there and everything that comes next is just like we've all lived that and it's not true um, yeah, I have a whole hour long lecture on what a mess my career has been. <laughs> so I, I always try and emphasize, you know, life is organic, um, you know, both literally and, and metaphorically. Um, and so, you know, how do we support women to um, to embrace that and em embrace that uncertainty, especially now when a lot of the jobs that women are doing now didn't even exist you know, five, 10 years ago, and certainly not, you know, when I was at school or university, like, no, no one ever sort of suggested that, that I could become a social media consultant, or a web designer, because none of that existed. So, you know, we need to prepare women for the future. And, and, and yeah, how do we, how do we do that? How, when we don't know what the future is? Yeah, I think the, the one other thing I would say, uh, before I answer this question is, um, it's so important that we bring men along the journey with us yeah. as career coaches involved in these programs that we don't always, you know, I think it's such an important part as you think about the programs that you have or what you participate in um, is to engage our male colleagues as well. And they want to be engaged and they, and they want to help um, on this as well. Many of them have daughters um, and uh, support uh, their female colleagues in the workforce too. So I think when you think about, you know, now is actually a great time to think about, I always think about leadership as it's very easy 
to lead when you understand what the path forward it's much more it's hard, difficult when you you have uncertainty and so i think when you think about how you build skills for the future there's a few things that we know there's a few things we know that you know technology is changing more rapidly than it ever has has been we know that this you know through the pandemic the the wave of digitization is only going to accelerate the speed at which we need to deliver new products and services to stay relevant is continually changing. So how do you think about that? One of the things are like sort of thinking about what are the base skill sets you need no matter what? Critical thinking skills. You know, so how do you hone your critical thinking skills? How do you think about like how to take a problem, break it down and solve it? How do you use the right level of data? And I say the right level of data because you can also see that sometimes you can overanalyze things. You're never gonna have perfection. And so I think really focusing on how do you get to the point where you can use your intuition and gut to make decisions um, as well. And so critical thinking skills, balancing how you think about decision-making and then understanding um, that you know things are gonna change. If you're so rigid, flexibility is critical. If you're so rigid about the path forward, some of the best inventions didn't come from the original idea, but someone's willingness to say, you know what, we're not going down this path anymore. It's time to take a detour. And so I think about that is, regardless of your career, what you know, what you don't know, you're going to have these moments of facing hurdles, facing those barriers. And it really is about how do you face that challenge? And do you have the courage to you know, jump over that barrier, go around it, however you need to navigate, or do you let it stop you? Do you say, I don't have that skill, I don't have that capability? And so many times it's a mindset around you know, sort of really understanding how you think about and how you propel yourself forward. Yeah, absolutely. So you are the first female CIO in tech for JP Morgan, and you're the first CIO to sit on the company's operating committee. Um, we often hear about women who are first this and first that. How important do you think it is to acknowledge these firsts? And, and what do they mean for you personally and for other women in the industry? Yeah, I would say first and foremost, I think about being the first chief information officer on the operating committee is by far the thing I think about the most. Technology is so critical to our business um, that, you know, I think the fact that technology has a seat at the table, it's valued as a role. It's imperative when you think about the things that we have to deal with on a daily basis in financial services, whether it's cybersecurity, critical operations at, at high speed, um, et cetera, the digital experiences we provide for our customers and clients. I think, you know, when I first became the CIO, um, that my the the technology team in in EMEA, the women in EMEA gave me this book. We were having a, a sit with me uh, a campaign event in in London, and they had created this red book for me. Um, and in that, they had all written personal messages. And it's one of those moments that you'll never forget in your career because when you're facing this huge responsibility. It was in a moment that you realize you have the power of all these women across to Mia who wrote me personal notes and basically said, we're right there behind you. And so not only is it a moment where you don't feel like you're by yourself at the top, it's a moment where you feel incredible support, but also an incredible responsibility, an, an incredible responsibility that I have to do everything in my power to make sure job one, that I'm the best CIO that um, JP Morgan Chase needs me to be to deliver for our customer clients and communities, but also to make sure that, that I'm a great representative of all the women who can see and believe that anything is possible and you can dream big and you can achieve anything that you want to achieve. And so that moment I will never forget because as I'm reading, as they're presenting this to me, they literally, um, was one of those moments where you just break down in tears and it's tears of joy and tears of happiness um, because you realize you have a whole, you have a whole bunch of people standing there right behind you. Oh, that's lovely. Um, 
So for people who aren't familiar, familiar um, and I must confess, I'm a little bit fuzzy about what this means as well, CIO, Chief Information Officer, what does your job look like? What are you responsible for? So I'm responsible for um, managing the, the entire technology budget, which you can imagine at a company like JP Morgan Chase is, is significant. Um, nearly $12 billion that we spend in technology have a team of over 50,000 resources. And, but when you think about my job, it's constantly shifting. So if you think about our core businesses, we, we move $6 trillion a day and it's, my responsibility, first and foremost, to make sure that money's moving efficiently, effectively, we're managing fraud, all those kind of things. So there's a huge operational part of the shop, making sure like now that everybody's primarily working from home, um, except for some of our you know core folks that are in branches or trading platforms, et cetera, you know, um, it's important that technology is working and that I can have this, you know, that we can really continue to support our customers and clients. So there's this operational side. There's a financial responsibility to make sure that we're spending every dollar and making every investment because there's significant dollars going into technology. There's a side of it that becomes innovation. How are we looking at, for example, my team is doing a virtual tour for, with Silicon Valley, what are all the latest technologies? How do we think about those? How do they? How can they help us um, enable our business um, going forward? And then, you know, a huge part of my job is managing risk every day. Cybersecurity risk is one of the greatest threats to financial services. And so, how are we protecting the bank? How are we protecting the financial services industry? How are we protecting our customers and clients? So, it's a, an, an incredible balance of operational um, performance, managing risk, innovation, um, and then of course driving execution with speed and security at scale to make sure we can deliver new products to the market um, every, you know, basically every day. Yeah. I mean, that is a huge amount of work and responsibility. Um, you also have three children. Um, so, you know, we talk a lot about work-life balance, that's kind of like a big conversation, but uh, quite often it seems much more like a theoretical thing that, that is just you know, abstracted out rather than uh, something practical that we apply to our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so how do you deal with um, balancing your life and, and, and what advice do you have for, for women who maybe look at a job like CIO and think, well, I'd like that, but Oh, it seems like quite a lot. I'm not sure how I'm going to balance my family and, and work together. Well, fortunately, my three kids are grown, but I've been a working mom um, for most of my whole career. And so I think for me, it's understanding the right amount of time you need to invest in each of those. And it becomes work-life integration. At least that's mm -hmm. the way I think about it, because especially with technology now, um, it's work-life integration as long as you understand that for those moments that really matter, whether it's at work or whether it's at home, you have to have presence. I always remember this terminology someone told me about being here now. When I would get home in time to make sure that I could get go to my kids' sporting events, I wasn't standing on the sideline reading my email. I was, I was there watching them play because they look over to the sideline to make sure you're paying attention. And so this presence thing is so important because so pe so many people have gotten really good at multitasking. And so I'm very sensitive that even when we're in meetings with my team and we have people presenting to us, so it's important at work too. Are you really engaging with the people that you're talking to? And because it's a, it's a great way to think about how do you optimize your time? Because when you're half paying attention, you're also half absorbing and half understanding. And so I think, you know, as I've thought about this whole work-life integration, for me, it's a couple things. Being present at home and at work and making, you know, figuring out the ways when that matters. It also has helped me really hone my prioritization skills. Even when I think about my email, there's the, I must respond today. I respond by the end of the week, or there's things I just pass off because I'm not going to respond to them. I'll give them to someone else to respond to. And so I think it's just thinking about how do you prioritize what's important? No one is superhuman. 
And so we all have this challenge. I think the other thing is sometimes we look at who's going to solve this problem for us. And many times you actually realize a lot of it is, you know, what we're putting on ourselves. And so taking personal accountability and thinking about all those kind of things, those are the things that I think has really helped me find this integration, especially as my kids were young, as my kids were older, and now as actually, you know, thinking about my kids as, and watching them grow. Yeah. It's hard if you're a younger parent and your kids are younger because you wonder. But let me tell you, when you get through the other side of it and you see the amazing things your children do, then you know, you know, you didn't make any mistakes. It's what's right for you and your family. And, um, you know, you will be so proud to see um, the incredible adults that they become. Yeah. So I think something that you, you said in there made me think about the tension between multitasking and monotasking that for decades, it feels like we've been told women are so good at multitasking. And it was like, well, yeah, because they have to. Whereas if you want to get something done, monotask, you, it's about creating a, a, a focus so that you are, as you say, you know, be here now and be present and focused. Um, and I think to some extent, we, we've been training ourselves out of monotasking and out of being focused. So do you have any kind of tips for how to get that focus back? Yeah, by the way, the first thing, um, the, other, the other thing that I didn't mention is, and I had to learn it, is we have to actually take care of ourselves mm -hmm. um, as well. So that's another important part of it. I think really finding time, because I think it relates to the second part of the question that you asked me here, taking time to make sure that we're refreshed. Um, because sometimes when you get so overwhelmed with all the things that you need to do, you can't actually think clearly about how do I break it down? Just the things we do in our job as technologists all the time. Here's the problem. How do I break it down? What is the right order of, of how I focus on things? So sometimes in that taking care of yourself, you have to take a deep breath. For some people, having that calmness is exercise, meditation, whatever works for you. Only you can define that. Um, but I then, then thinking clearly about not being overwhelmed by that to-do list, mm -hmm. but how are you going to approach it? I think about the hardest things I gotta deal with in the day, I do them first. That works for me. I carve out Fridays because I was thinking I've got too much work flowing into the weekend and I need to take a day, at least one day, to recharge. And so I started blocking out a significant portion of time on Fridays to learn new things um, to learn, but also to catch up on my email before the end of the week. And so I think there's lots of ways that are all in our control. Meeting management is a good one. Are you going to meetings? Should you be there? Do they need to be an hour? Can they be 30 minutes, 45 minutes? Get to the point. What, what's the problem you're trying to solve? So lots of little tricks around um, thinking about how did it help me optimize my time. And then I think when it comes to, to your family, um, you know, I'm fortunate to have a wonderful help husband that can help me through this journey as well. But again, really making sure we're prioritizing what's important. What are those kids going to, what are your kids, what are your husband going to remember? And again, making sure that's a top priority when you think about all the things that you have to do. They're the ones that are going to always be there for you when you go through tough times in your career and when you're celebrating those exciting career opportunities. Absolutely. Um, so I understand you took a, a career break. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you navigated your return to work? And you, can you talk a little bit as well about what can we do to better support women who are returning after a break? Yeah, um, it's it's something I actually like to talk about because some people think it's impossible to reach a CIO of a Fortune 50 company if you actually took some time off. I worked part time for six years. So my career break wasn't stopping working, but it was significantly reducing my hours. It was moving into an individual contributor role. Um, and so I was able to navigate through that when my children were really young. And this is something we all have to do. It's part of that, that work-life integration back to, um, 
there are different moments in your career where it's okay to say, I'm going to put some things on pause. I'm going to make sure my family is taken care of because if I know they're taken care of, I'm actually going to be more effective at work as well. And so for six years, I did work part time. Then it got to the point where my kids were getting a little bit older um, and I knew that I had the right support system in place that I could re-engage into the workforce full time. Um, and it really started with me thinking about managing my expectations around what was I going to, to achieve next and being comfortable that sometimes you may need to take another role that's more of a horizontal move than a vertical move just to sort of re-engage, give yourself that time. Um, and really what I did when I started to do that is make sure I worked with the right mentors, supporters, coaches around um, how could I do that? Talk to others that had been through it. You find that there's more people out there that have been through a career change than you actually realize. And then just being clear with my manager and realizing that I was actually putting more pressure on myself to feel like I needed to get up to a productive place more than even the workplace was expecting me to. Some of the things we think about now is it's 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 very similar to the type of programs that if we're pulling in talent in an alternative pipeline where we put them through um, coaching and development. One of the things um, that we hear from women when they try to re-enter the workforce is technology's changed so quickly. How do I have the skill sets? Well, we can have, we can do a coding boot camp. We can have programs that help bring people up to speed on technologies such as AI and cloud computing, et cetera. And then you realize those are all things that can be learned and are easy, easy to be learned over time. What, you know, the aspects that made you a good software engineer or other role when you decided to leave the workforce are still there. Critical thinking skills, ability to break a complex problem down into smaller pieces, all kinds of things like that. The passion for creating value um, and creating products and services and experiences. And so I think those are some of the ways that we need to think about it. And then just make sure they have a supporter, mentor, that we bring them in, we try different jobs, we see which one's the right fit, we give them some time to really re-emerge before we sort of finalize what's what's the right role going forward. Those are some of the things that we've thought about in this space. Again, another space, I think we will continuously learn um, how to do it even better going forward. Fantastic. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I hear a lot of engineering as well um, because we have these STEM job shortfalls that returners are even more important to the industry than ever before. And, and we're hearing much more about returnships. Yeah. Um, so, you know, for me, I think you know, industry is starting to really grapple with this side, the, the issues that women especially face when, when they are returning. And I think that's, um, you know, what we maybe forget a little bit is that, you know, women who've been out of the workforce, they come back, um, not just with the skills that they left with and, and the, uh, the the sort of abilities and talents that they left with, but you pick up more, you know, that they they you develop more, particularly if you're um, if you have a family, you may not realize it. And I think a lot of um, mothers that I speak to, they they wouldn't necessarily believe this of themselves, but you can see, you know, that having um, a family or you know, breaking to uh, care for elderly relatives, you know, you you develop other sorts of skills as well, and that we can recognize those and bring those into play as well yeah i totally agree things like empathy something that's so critical as we think about how we build solutions that integrate um with people more and more um digital experiences etc that's just one example but i i think there's so many skills when we think about our breadth of skills to keep in mind that we're continuing to learn and develop how we manage priorities, all those kind of things, um, you know, for me were things that I really honed when I was trying to balance more between working part time, spending more time at home as well. Yeah. So I've been told that Sia's song Unstoppable is very important to you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about why that is? Yeah, so I think when you think about the song Unstoppable by Sia. It's such a song of empowerment. And for me, it was one of those, you know, like I had to create the playlist. You know, everybody has those days when you're 
dealing with lots of things and you're trying to think about, you know, how do I encourage myself? How do I empower myself? It's like the pump up songs that athletes listen to many, many times. And so when you think about the words in that song, um, I, you know, things like I'm so powerful, I don't need batteries to play. Um, when you think about words like strong, confident, it's full of those kind of things. And of course it says over and over, I'm unstoppable today. I'm unstoppable today over and over. And so it has special meaning for me because when I was tapped on the shoulder, I had this in my playlist, but this happened to be a song that really resonated with me and the words resonated with me. And when I was tapped on the shoulder to interview for the chief information officer at JP Morgan Chase, and I walked to work that morning for my series of interviews, um, I put that song on replay. And I walked in that door with a lot of confidence, a lot of strength, um, feeling powerful um, and feeling unstoppable. Fabulous, fabulous. I think everyone should go and listen to it directly after the webinar. Um, so when I go back, there's a, a thread that we we keep touching on that I wanna uh, look at directly. Um, you spent a long time working in healthcare, then you moved into finance six years ago when you joined JP Morgan. Um, that must have been quite a learning curve for you. And you've in fact mentioned the importance of, of keeping learning new things. Um, how do you do that? I mean, you, you mentioned a little bit about your Fridays, but how do you find the time? Because I think the um, it's very easy to put off that moment of like, oh, actually, I'm going to sit and I'm going to read this thing or I'm going to watch this this uh, webinar or I'm going to take this course. It's so easy to put that off infinitely into the future. So how do you make sure that you do keep uh, on top of your own personal learning and development? Just to further emphasize this point, when you sh when I shifted from healthcare into financial services, there are many things that were relevant. And that's the thing when you think about using the skills you have. Both are heavily regulated industries. Both use data and information and create products and services. Both have complex value chains when you think about all the different things. But there were many things I didn't know. And so, you know, when, when I faced that, first of all, one of the things that I did, especially as I was new to the industry, I made sure before I started, I did a lot of education around sort of the basics. I sought out who were some of the key influencers and what could I learn? You know, you have to proactively go out there and learn about the business. And you find that people are so willing, they're so excited and passionate about it that they're willing to, to, to teach you. And even today I will do this. If we're in a meeting and I hear a term that I don't quite understand, I write it on my list. And I make sure before I end the week, I've, I researched a little bit more. I understand it a bit more. I call somebody to have them explain it to me. And I think the one thing that 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 I clearly learned and Sue, it was something that you said is you have to make the time. You can't put these in bucket three. These need to be in bucket one because the things that that you're learning now or the things that you don't understand are so critically important, especially when you sit in a role like mine where you constantly have to go broad and you constantly have to go deep. You know, I have to deeply understand financial services. I have to understand the breadth of financial services and the same is true with technology. So when I reflect back, I think it really forced me, especially when I got into JP Morgan and then uh, continued on into this role, is to really hone. I think if I look now, if I reflect back almost being here seven years now, it's probably been the most accelerated learning and development part of my career and who would have, you know, thought that, you know, with all the various opportunities and learning and development I've had along my career, but it is in fact true that it's it's so critical to your ongoing development and especially when you get into bigger and more senior roles. Yeah. So just to uh, move to a totally different topic, uh, but one I think everyone's uh, uh, has experience of, the COVID-19 pandemic has upended everything for everyone. Uh, how have you coped over the last six months? Um, and and what kind of permanent changes do you think might come out of, or do you think should come out of this experience? Yeah, so um, 
The first thing we wanted to do, of course, is make sure that our employees were safe and that we were able to transition 250,000 people uh, to working at to working at home. Clearly, somebody's trying to get a hold of me. <laughs> to, to clearly, working at at home, and so that was. Um, you know, priority one, how do we keep our employees uh, safe, et cetera? Priority two, um, about the same is how do we make sure we continuously support our clients and customers? And so for us, that was, yes, we may be transitioning uh, uh, the way we do something um, at work to at home, but how do we need to make sure that we're rapidly innovating and creating those experiences, whether it's rich video experiences for those client to client engagements, or digital channels. So as the government stimulus programs in the United States were coming out, how do we make sure that our customers of Chase had access to the information, et cetera, that they needed, whether it's small businesses or consumers looking um, to see if their stimulus checks had been deposited, et cetera. And then finally, um, we started to talk about what are the key things that we needed to accelerate um, beyond that. And then the, the key things that, that we needed to accelerate um, were things that were really a part of our digital strategy and our digital agenda. We just looked at, you know, obviously with, with COVID, what are the processes, what are the things that weren't as fully automated as they needed to be? We needed to fully aut uh, automate the onboarding of new employees because now we're fully mm -hmm. automating uh, onboarding new empl employees in a virtual world. And so many things like that were the key areas of focus. So when you think about um, how are things going to look as you go forward, the first thing I would say is we're going to continue to see this accelerated trend of digitization. You're going to see many things. We think we've thought a lot about some of the ways that we interact with our clients. We're much more relationship in person. Are there those opportunities? I think everybody sees training and development, how you can have presence, how you use technology to experience that. Many times when you think about product agile teams, they're a little bit more in person. So what are some of the ways um, that you can do that? I think it's brought a lot more thinking around flexibility, the integration of where you work, um, and not just what you do but and how you do it, but where you do it. Um, I think those are all trends that, that we're going to continue to see. And the final thing, which I would say is critically important for the rest of all of that is the speed of decision making. I think it highlighted for every business where things were um, fast and where they needed to be and where things were slow. And I think for me, when I think about it is it definitely for us put a spotlight on the continued investment in technology. Uh, to really drive an efficient and effective uh, business that really brings the rich client experiences uh, to our customers and clients every day and just how we're thinking about that and the speed at which we're implementing that agenda. Yeah, and I, I think as well there's a real um, uh, emphasis that uh, we need to be flexible in our thinking. Uh, obviously, Ada Lovelace Day is normally an in-person event in London. That can't happen this year. Um, but we've managed to adapt and, and I think actually it, it, it's, it's certainly made me think more broadly about well, what are our aims? What is it ultimately that we're trying to do and how can we do that differently and maybe even do things that we wouldn't normally have done or been able to do? For example, I, we wouldn't have been able to fly you over to, uh, to London for a 10 minute talk, um, whereas now we get a whole hour with you, which is great. Um, so I want to uh, shift now to some questions. We've had a few questions in. Um, JR3 Sampath asks, how long do you sleep and will you compromise on your sleep? Okay, so this is an important one to me because it's something I used to um, not get as much sleep as I should have. So I generally will make sure I get a minimum of six hours. It never used to be that way a night because I've realized that that taking care of self is important that I actually get the sleep I need. I'm a morning person, so I tend to be up uh, 4 35 a.m. Um, and uh, make sure that I'm fitting time in for uh, learning, reflection, exercise, and the thing that I've actually, it's a, it's part of my 2020 resolution, 
um, is getting more sleep. So it's not been the thing I've been the best at, but I know that it's critical to recharging, keeping stress levels in check and keeping overall health. And so I'm personally working on uh, doing a better job in that department. Thanks. And I'm, I'm quite good at sleep where I fall over is um, uh, exercise, which I think is, is, is equally as important. I find it very easy uh, to get up in the morning and then think, oh, I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. Um, and I think this is kind of you know, really critical to, to get past that and commit. Uh, and once you've committed to hold yourself to account. Um, so we also have uh, Valeria Tafoya from Mexico who hosted um, an, AL, uh, an Ada Lovelace Day event last year. Thank you, Valeria. Um, that's awesome. Um, she asks, uh, what are some ways that you address uh, empowering other women? So one of the things I think is really important is that we as women also pay it forward. And so um, when I think about empowering other women, that also means um, not just motivating them and cheering them on, of course we do that, but also being one of their toughest you know, critics. When I say that, I mean it in a positive way, a coaching and a development way, because we can't always, you know, being honest with people about where are their opportunities to improve is so helpful in terms of their career development and journey. And so I think about in terms of empowering, it also means um, A, giving, coaching them, giving them the confidence, pushing them outside of their, their uncomfortable zone. I am so grateful and it's so rewarding to me when I push someone a little bit hard. And then a year later, I get a message. I've taken on this new job responsibility. If we didn't have this conversation, but that's, that's balance. So it mm -hmm. has to be a balanced message of coaching, developing, getting people to see what is possible, pushing them to dream big, but being comfortable, giving them open and honest feedback about the areas that they also need to improve. And so I am all about empowering women, but I'm also about coaching and developing mm -hmm. and giving that feedback as a key part of coaching and developing. And I think there's a, a flip side to that coin, which is um, you have to, as a young woman in STEM, seek feedback and learn how to take feedback graciously and how to um, really benefit from what you've been uh, told and, and 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 what you've learned because I think it it's very very easy and I know I was a bit like this when I was younger to sort of see feedback as as nothing more than criticism you know which it isn't the reason that someone is giving you feedback is because they want to help you improve and the more you improve the more successful you'll be further down the line so you know Feedback is, is really about helping you to build on your foundations and to develop your skill set. Um, so I think actively seeking feedback from people and, and really doing the emotional work to understand how to, um, how to listen to that feedback and then how to integrate that information is, is all incredibly important as well. Um, because I, I think we all have had moments where people have given us feedback we've not listened to. Um, and, you know, it's something that I, I wish I'd learned to seek that out earlier in my career. I think um, that would have really, really helped. Um, it's so true. I think one mindset shift you can think about is consider feedback as a gift. If you get feedback and you immediately jump to, oh, that's not true, or all the reasons that you can justify, oh, they must have interpreted that, Think about feedback as a gift. Somebody had the courage and they cared enough to, to help you learn and develop and grow. And I think, um, Sue, your points are so incredibly important around the mindset we put around feedback. And one thing I do, and I do it with my boss today, if I'm not getting feedback, I just hear the positive, I'm pushing for the, what is that one area I can develop? Because it's really important to me, I understand what my strengths are. Some of the best leaders are really good at understanding their strengths and where their opportunities are for development um, because you're more practical and realistic about you know, how you are growing and developing as a leader and, and that clearly will translate into your degree of success. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So another comment from Sea Dog who asks, what are your top three tips for a young professional starting their career? So top three tips. Oh, if I have to put them on uh, in. Well, let me just give you three that I think are important. There's probably many that I could give. Um, first and foremost, really embrace in learning the business, reaching out, understanding, like, don't just, you know, focus on the thing that's in front of you. How does the company operate? Who are your customers? Because it's so important to understand the work that you're working on, how it ties into the overall ecosystem. And if you always come at things with the mindset of how do I make that better, that broad, you're, you're already practicing that broad thinking and the deep thinking. The deep thinking is likely tied to the specific thing that, that you're working on. Be that continuous learner that we continue to talk about. And the other thing I would just say is really practice this take on risks. It, if you take on risks, you are going to fail. We've all had failures. Use those as learning experiences. Be open-minded about that. I think you actually find as you grow and develop in your career, there is much more reception, especially at this pace that things are moving to people that are understand and willing to point out the things that they didn't do well, the things that they need to focus on and acknowledge that versus always talking about how great everything is. Um, and so I would really think about those dimensions um, and push yourself outside of that comfortable zone. Don't wait until someone says you're ready for the next thing. You should be actively looking ahead, not just the next assignment, but the, the following thing. And it's about skill building. It's not about the job. You should never run to a job. You should never run from a job, excuse me. You should run to a job because you're thinking about, especially in this part of your career, how are you building your portfolio of skills? Too many times people look at, this job's gonna take me to the top quickly. Build your skills and those opportunities will come. Um, and I think it's just really important to think about that as you think about your career, especially when you're younger in your career. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Vivian Ojo says, uh, what are the top three skills of the future and how can female talent harness them? That's a great question. It is a great question because I think it actually ties to some of the strengths that we have. When you think about the skills of the future, think about even how we talk about infrastructure, right? A hybrid cloud environment, edge computing, where you run your applications is going to be all over the place. So this connected world that we have means that we need people that are really good at understanding how to connect the dots, how to see how something fits into that broader ecosystem. And you'll see that that ties back to some of the feedback that I mentioned earlier. So how do you connect the dots? Really hone in on your critical thinking skills. The world is getting more complicated, not simpler. So when you're assessing a problem, are you thinking about it from what you know? Or are you expanding your mind to say, and are you listening to what might be other things? So be very conscious about what you don't know as well as what you do know. And when you don't know something, get the resources and, and the understanding because it's just so important that when you think about how we need to connect the dots and bring people together and create these integrated solutions, and apply our critical thinking, it's, it, again, it's just important that we know what we know, we know what we don't know as well when you think about the future because technology is gonna change. Customer experiences are gonna change. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. Get comfortable operating without a sense of, you know, clarity about what the outcome is gonna be. And that will set you up to successfully navigate whatever challenge you face in the future. Yeah. And I think probably our final question, um, Jayasri Sampath asks, uh, can you spend a minute on conflict management in priority tasks? Yeah, so, you know, there's conflicts that happen all the time, you know, especially when you get a great mind of intelligent people working together. Everybody's got a strong opinion. And so, one of the things that I think is incredibly important is to focus on 
What is the outcome you're trying to derive? And what are the key, what we sometimes call OKRs, objectives and key results? And never lose sight of what you're trying, if you're in the middle of a debate or an argument, where are you going? And sometimes you have to remind the group of, this is the destination, this is the outcome we're trying to achieve. And is and are we actually getting that? Are we getting wrapped up in opinions? And there's a lot of opinions around how to implement things or technology to apply. The one thing that I think is critically important is how you navigate the discussion so everybody feels like they're heard. Listening skills are incredibly important when you think about um, navigating conflict. You have to make sure that you're pausing and listening to others' perspectives. So many times people have a strong opinion and they only see things their way. Again, an inclusive environment is that I'm listening to alternative perspectives. I'm taking that feedback. I'm pausing. I'm thinking about the outcome I'm trying to achieve. And I package that together and I navigate through the resolution of conflict. One thing that's also important is who has key authority and decision rights. And understanding that, that even though I may be something that not may not own, somebody that may not own the final decision, I have to support what ultimately the decision that's made by whoever has you know the final authority to make that decision. Those are some some tactics that I use when I think about resolving conflict because it's everywhere. You get to the best answer, and conflict is not a bad thing. It can be a very positive thing and it should be there because you get everybody's best thinking. Fantastic. Well, I'm afraid we have now run out of time. It's uh, uh, on the hour. So I just want to thank you so much, Laurie. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Um, and uh, I'm so glad that you've been uh, able to be a part of Ada Lovelace Day this year. Thank you, Sue. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone.